All right, everybody, welcome to the Leadership Mastermind Podcast. I am Mitch Peak, and this is my host, Laura Brandeo. How are you, Laura? I am wonderful, Mitch. All right, looking forward to hearing from our guest today. I would love to introduce you all to Johnny Fowler. He is the Corporate Development Manager at NRL Mortgage and a mortgage industry veteran who has spent over 20 years building businesses across the country. Johnny has a heart for people, and his greatest joy comes from sharing his knowledge of the industry to help others succeed. For the past few years, he's traveled all the over the country teaching business owners how to utilize social media to drastically change their businesses. He's a two-time best-selling author and we know that you are going to enjoy his insights today. Okay, and on the Leadership Mastermind podcast, we want to provide our audience with insights and perspectives from our industry experts so you can learn, grow, and be inspired to be a leader to your clients and to your teams. All right, Mitch, let's kick it off. All right. Welcome, Johnny. How are you? I'm doing great. I need to carry Laura with me everywhere. My God, that was <laughs> that was just amazing and beautiful. <laughs> she is. She is. Uh, she's got that down pat with the introductions. I'll tell you. <laughs> no ifs, ands, or buts. That was like Golden Globe stuff there. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, I think when we had Steve Sims on the podcast. He was like, "Man, I, I think I, I need Laura too." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it makes me sound amazing. <laughs> Laura would be a great hype person for Steve. There you go. Right. You got your next calling, Laura. I guess so. <laughs> Who knew, right? right? All right, Johnny. Well, let's get this thing started. So I'm going to ask you what we ask all of our guests, and that is, what are your top three key pillars to leadership? All right. Um, as I was thinking about this, uh, and this question came to mind, um, I don't necessarily think that there are three mainstays that I have sitting in my back pocket that I try and follow these three per se. So I'd rather have a conversation. Let's go through it. And I'm going to tell you things that are important to me that I think leaders need. I think leaders need to uh, uh, lead by example. Uh, one of the things that, that I, I know for a fact is that that person needs to actually be doing something, helping something. We all see those jokes and the memes about, you know, the boss versus the leader, things like that. And I, I think that that person needs to be working at least if not twice as hard as their, their following, their, their staff, whatever that may be. Uh, you'll lose respect for people when, um, when they're not actually putting forth an effort, when they're not actually bringing value, I think, to the table. So yeah. I, I think that that's something that, that is quite important. You have to have uh, that great work ethic. You have to realize there's so many people, and I, I see this with, with new managers, uh, new managers, new leaders that think that when you get that promotion to that management position, that I don't have to work anymore. I just have right. to supervise and, and, and I got to answer to people. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I saw a post the other day by Eddie Perez from Equity Prime Mortgage. And his thing was, I don't expect my employees to work as hard as yep. I do because That's it's right. not their company. That <laughs> is exactly company, right. I should work harder than they are, to your mm -hmm. point. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you. I think that's a great point. That's a great, you know, it, it's a that's a great snippet to use that everybody should think about, and and maybe that should be inside of their Bible that they follow on a daily basis in business. Uh, I think one of those three may be uh, innovation, um, and and realizing uh, that things change, that you have to change, and you have to come up with new ideas whether it be marketing, whether it be operations, whatever it is, uh, keep your eyes and your ears open to look and see and realize that, that you need to stay on top of the market or at least on top of your portion of the market. That doesn't mean that you have to go out and invest, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in you know, new software, but it does mean that if the rest of the market is passing you by with technology, that you got to get in there. You got to do something. 
Uh, and, and I think that, that being inclusive with that, uh, whether it, it be in your marketing, your operations, whatever that may be, that you, you have to always innovate. You have to always come up with ideas uh, that you always have to include your people, your team to make sure that everybody is on the same page. One of the surest things to do is to uh, implement uh, a system or implement any kind of program that doesn't have the backing of everybody or at least the greater you know, pr uh, portion. I've seen companies do this. I've seen them uh, uh, bring in a, a new software system or even, even personnel that um, th there was not a, a consensus or at least some sort of knowledge brought out by everybody that said, yep, this is it. 70% of the people saying, yep, let's try this. And, and with the understanding that we're all rowing the same way, we don't want anything to fail. Uh, we, we want to push forward with it. We think it's a good idea, but also knowing that at the time that it's not working, that again, we're all in this together. Let's make that consensus decision. I think another thing that people need to grasp, and this is something that uh, I did not grasp for years uh, starting out. I think Laura said it, you know, God, it makes me sound so damn old when, you know, 20 <laughs> plus years. Um, it's, but like, I it's like our kids, Johnny. You know, at, when we get to a certain point, we just stop saying how long we're in the industry, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, unless you're a realtor, you have to say how long you're in the business if you're a realtor. I think it's mandatory. Um, but uh, I got into this business in 1994 as an originator, so that's 26, 27 years ago. And um, when I first got in, and I don't know if part of it is the type A personality. I don't know if part of it is gender. I don't know if it's regional, whatever it is. But uh, when I first got into the business, failure was not an option. And you didn't talk about failure. Uh, failure was a weakness. Um, and it was something that was just not anybody who was any good never failed. Right. And for me, it got to be, um, it, it, you know, internal. It was an internal struggle because I would do things that did not work. And I would beat myself up so bad because it didn't work or I tried so damn hard to do something and it was wrong or it didn't work. And, and I look around at what I thought, you know, at the time my peers were, and I know there's no way that any of these guys have ever failed, you know? Right. And, and when I was in the mortgage business, it was, um, uh, you know, the, the Louis Ranieri's of the business. It was the, uh, uh, you know, Mozilla, uh, those guys mm -hmm. that, that you followed, that you paid attention to. And I, I know for a fact that those guys never failed. You know, how could the guy who invented the mortgage-backed security have ever failed? So I, I think that that's something that's important to realize now as I get older, to realize that, to grasp it, to learn from it. And I think that it's it's even to the point, and this may be bold, that I think we have to share that. Um, yeah. it, I, I was so happy. I, I don't know about you guys. Are, are you guys uh, on Clubhouse and paying attention to Clubhouse? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have I have gotten to the point, not 100%, but I want to say 70%, if I'm in my vehicle, instead of listening to XM, I'm listening to Clubhouse. Wow. And I got on last night, as soon as I left my office, uh, my normal work times are from about 7, 7.30 in the morning till 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And, uh, that's, and that's good for me because I'm happy that way. You know, people say you've got this work-life balance thing. That This works for me. It works for my family. But I'm on my way home and I'm listening to one of the clubhouse rooms and it's Grant Cardone's room. And I don't know if you're a fan or not. I, I absolutely... I'm a Grant Cardone fan all day long. And he was talking about multifamily. He thinks that that's where uh, people like us that are in 
the mortgage business, the real estate business that have the know-how that that's something that we should be paying more attention to than we are. And, um, but the coolest thing about this is he started off telling us how he failed yeah. his first property, how he failed and what he screwed up on his second property, how he failed, what he screwed up on, what to look for. And I, I, it hit my heartstrings anyway, very strongly right. that somebody who is, you know, just multi, multi, multi millionaire, but not only that, just successful, just true to life successful, was able to go out in front of, you know, thousands of people and talk about failure. And it really did me well. And, and I think that, that we as leaders probably have to share that more. Yeah, I think, uh, not to the I point where leaders, I think leaders owe it to their following to to show their failures because it you know it, it gives people an unrealistic you know expectation in life when you're following you know these very successful people and then you think that everything they do is just golden and successful and then when you fail you're like well I'm never going to be like them you know yeah, right. and, not have that and bottom bottom line nothing ventured nothing gained you have to absolutely expose yourself to new things and you learn from those mistakes you learn from those missteps and johnny what what a great great topic i mean if we can dive into the you know now let's dive into let's that do right it. because i agree with you i mean i came into the mortgage industry in the 90s also so i absolutely can appreciate the timing we we certainly are on the same page and you're right no one spoke about it and, and it was, it, it's not even gender, it's not even, I think it was that period of time. I think it was just, all you ever heard was, these guys are crushing it. And when I say guys, guys and gals, you know, when these guys are crushing it. And if you're not doing it, then you must be doing something wrong, right? That was the mindset. But not anymore. I think now the time has turned where we can expose ourselves. And I love to use the word, being vulnerable. We can be vulnerable to say, hey, listen, I, you know, I always like when you speak, you spoke about the change management, right? You spoke about making changes within your organization. I can remember a one story in my organization where we rolled out, we had a paperless system early, 2010. I mean, we were rolling out paperless, you know, 09, 10. It was the worst disaster that I have ever experienced in my entire career, literally a million dollars down the drain, and I had to pull the plug and restart. I think I'm very thankful for that. Because if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have restructured my company to have remote employees back in 2010, long before people were doing that because of that mistake. But we do need to share it. And we do need to openly have those with everyone because it shows that, yeah, sometimes the worst mistakes are the best successes in the future. So how do you recommend people share some of this? And what do you do with your teams in order to make it a positive experience from a failure? Give me two seconds. I'll get into that. But I want to tell you something. When you said that, it, it's it's one of those things. It's that shell shock. <laughs> the company that I was with back uh, started in 98 with. Um, we closed and, and we bragged about this dramatically and drastically. Uh -huh. We closed the first two completely paperless loans ever in U.S. history. And I want to say it was 2001 when we actually wow. closed them. What we didn't tell people <laughs> is we couldn't sell that shit to save our lives. <laughs> we were stuck on our lines for decades because we couldn't sell, because it was so jacked up. Oh, yeah. So, we, you know, we, we put out articles and, and press releases and all this about this great feat, but we never told anybody. We're still servicing that crap. Oh, I love that. But I love that story because it's true, right? Look it was what the we late did. 90s, early 2000s. We didn't tell nobody. Oh, that is a great story. <laughs> so, so back to your question. 
Uh, how do we use this? Yeah. Um, I, I think for me personally, it was a little difficult at first um, sharing this. And um, when, where I first where I first shared it was by accident. Um, and, and, and this has just been here in the past few years, four years or so. Yeah. Um, I think at the time, Brian Stevens from the National Real Estate Post, he mm -hmm. and I were talking, and I think we were actually on camera, and um, somehow it was brought up uh, about the Midas touch and everything turns to gold and all mm -hmm. of that. And I, I just snickered. And it wasn't about me. It was just about somebody or something in general. And I just snickered. And, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, so what are you laughing at? And I'm like, man, that's not true. We fail every freaking day. The only people who don't fail are people... If you don't want to fail, don't do anything. Don't do anything. That's right. Just sit there. Because even if you're going to your job, you're going to get a flat tire. You're going to end a car wreck. There's going to be something that prevents you from getting there on time. You know, there's going right. to be a fail. Now, so for me, it was it was um, not necessarily an epiphany. It was more of, I guess, diarrhea of the mouth. I just, you know, I don't have any filters. And, and I said what I was thinking, and then it, because I said it out loud, it made it acceptable to me. So right. until I said it out loud, it, it was something that I never talked about. It was quiet. We didn't say anything. So the reason I bring that up is I think that may be something. One of the things that I think that people should do is should have some sort of think tank, some sort of... Um, uh, whether it be a mentorship, whatever it is, just people that you can talk to that are on at least the same level as you, if not higher, um, to where you, you can you can release these thoughts. So you don't want to talk to somebody who, it, we all know this person, the person that's always negative, always has something negative, you know, everything, the sky is always falling, we're dying, we're failing, you know, whatever it is. Not those people, it's the people who, who have either been where you're at or the people who want to see you succeed. And I think that, that that for me, one of the easiest ways was being in that comfort zone and talking about this. Just like, you know, Laura, you and I can talk about failure all day long from 1994 forward. Mm -hmm. But uh, up until about 2014 or so, I couldn't talk about it. You, you and know, I, right. I feel the same way, Johnny. I mean, I can I can absolutely tell you. And I add another component on my side. We've got the women. I've got the women of the industry that literally were never able to speak of some of the things that we experienced coming up. And, I, and I'm not speaking really bad things, more of just how we felt, like being in a very male-dominated industry. But all of that has changed. I yeah. mean, the glory of all of it is over the last couple of years, and I don't know why. I'm not really sure what changed over the last few years, but it really is an amazing time, and I love your recommendation. Being in a mastermind, being in a mentoring program, just your tribe, whatever that tribe is, it's amazing that when you start having those conversations with, like you said, your level or above, all of a sudden you're like, hey, they experience the same thing. They've gone through that. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one that had that struggle. And even your story about the 2001 paper list, I mean, that's hysterical to me. But I remember 2001 and I, you know, my files were this high. And <laughs> yeah, I remember. So do you remember the first time anybody introduced AUS to you? Oh, yeah, I do. Oh. I remember. Listen, I was on the beta for Chase Zippy. I, I literally was the beta <laughs> tester for his Chase Zippy. <laughs> yes. I like to uh, liken what you're saying, you know, about failing back to a sport that I was never in, but wrestling. So my son started wrestling when he was in first grade, I believe. And just seeing, you know, I think wrestlers have an advantage in life because oh. they, you know, first of all, it's just, it's a sport, but it's just you. You're going out there. You're in a, you know, a tight outfit. <laughs> You're exposing yourself to the world. Vulnerable. And, it, and, and it's only you that you have to hold accountable. If you fail, it's you. If you win, it's you. 
And, you know, it's just you and one other person out there and watching him do that. It, it began to say, well, you know, I understand why wrestlers, you know, people I meet that are great people in life. I'm like, you know, like, oh, yeah, I wrestled in high school or I wrestled in college. And you start to understand that because they were exposed to that kind of, you know, in the beginning of life. And, then, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't bother them. Their failures are right out there in front of everybody every single day. And I think that's kind of, you know, what wrestling is teaching, you know, kids from a young age. The one thing, though, that I can think about wrestling is, yeah, you are on your own. You are out there by yourself, but it's also a team sport. Right. Because yeah. you're, you're representing a school. And, and I really think, and, and I don't want to, you know, and I'm not trying to be politically correct. I don't want to, you know, not include anybody. But I think team sports truly – Whatever it is, whether it be a ball sport, whether it be the debate club, whatever it is, but I think team sports is something that is imperative in business. And and I, I've heard people talk about this, and I'm so glad you brought that up about wrestling because it, it's one of those ones. It kind of reminds me of the, uh, the uh, advertisements for the Army, an army of one. Right. You're on your own. Whatever it is that you do, but you also represent these other 800 people kind of deal. But I, I was talking to somebody, um, and, and they said, you know, never got a chance to play team sports, blah, 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 things like that. And, and I said, you know, but that's not accurate. Because still at this point in your life, if you're in your 20s, 30s, even 40s, hell, even older than that, they still have senior softball leagues, things like that. And right. I really think that people need to be part of that, not necessarily just for the socializing, but for learning, but, but developing team skills. It's not all on me, but at the same time, it's all on me. Right. When, I, when I'm playing right field, that's because I've got a great arm and the ball is going to come to me, you know, every so often, blah, blah, blah. But when they're relying on me, they're relying on me. When I'm going up to bat, they're relying on me every single time. But it goes against my record, my RBIs, my batting average, things like that. And I right. think that that the team, regardless whatever it is, I'm going to call it team sports, is something that's greatly, greatly necessary, important, no matter what. Absolutely. Yeah, very true. All right. So now I want to get into the social media side. All okay. right. So take us back. All right. You you started in the industry. You know, Johnny, I, I say it all the time. People don't even realize what a blessing social media is because when we... <laughs> When he started, we were, you know, we were going to the, the courthouse to try to go get, you know, leads and then stuff like that. We didn't have this wonderful, you know, networking ability by using social media. So how did you first start getting into social media tied within the mortgage industry? And then how did you really dive into focus in on that and what came out of it? So for me, there's a lot of things that, that, that derive from this kind of core thing that I've got. Um, I don't care for lazy people. I don't care for uh, uh, the, the, the braggarts, the, the big-winded people, things like that. So um, I've got to do things on my own and figure it out on my own and, and, and see what it is. But... I was introduced to uh, a young man by the name of Ryan Stuman back years ago. Mitch knows him well. And I was introduced to Ryan Stuman years ago. And up until about 2014, uh, to me, all social media was uh, was just a place to go talk to your mom, go talk to your, you know, your cousins, your friends, people you hadn't seen since high school, things like that. And um, uh, sitting through a few of Ryan's podcasts, a few of his lectures, a few of his classes together, all of a sudden, and I'm pretty sharp, but it only took me about 10 times to hear it before <laughs> it actually got into my ears. Um but uh, after listening to what he was saying and then translating it into my mind, 
on on what this you know it wasn't new by any means but what this new thought of a system had the capabilities of doing and what it was already doing i didn't realize that i was already so far behind in 2015 how i had been on facebook since 2008 you know how can i be behind right <laughs> and um all of a sudden i heard stewin talking about it and it was like a mule kicking me in the head it's like oh shit and then i started really diving into it and really started trying to learn and figure out and then pay attention to i've got a mechanical brain and trying to pay attention to algorithms mm -hmm. trying to pay attention to specificities <laughs> That, <laughs> that were about an audience. And then the more that I dove into it, the more that I paid attention, I was able to, like I said, I don't have very good filters. So I, I would have people uh, say things. Like I, I had a, a realtor one time, and this wasn't even a class that was mine. This was me attending somebody else's class. And the question was brought to me and I had a realtor say, you know, how on earth could social media ever beat old fashioned door knocking? And I said, well, the easiest thing in the world, let me tell you how. Because yep. in your old fashioned door knocking, first of all, half of us don't want you knocking on our door. At a minimum, half of us don't want you knocking on our door. Now, out of the people who are left that, that, that are going to answer the door, you're going to be greeted with something like, what the hell do you want? <laughs> you know, it, times have changed. Back when I was a kid growing up, if somebody knocked on the door, we got all excited. We let a man come yeah, on in. Right. You know, there was actually special furniture for them. Yeah. We weren't allowed to see. The parlor. You the could parlor. let them into the parlor. <laughs> yeah. I had to drink out of the hose, but all of a sudden, nice drinks and nice stuff came out when people knocked on our door. Then all of a sudden that changed. We didn't want people knocking on our door anymore. So now I've got a realtor asking me how this is going to be. I said, it's the easiest thing in the world. You guys already farm an area. So farm that area on social media. Take over the page that is set up for whatever that neighborhood, that city, that town, and then get the data to make a lookalike audience and then do something that is so far out of your comfort zone, you're going to say no to. As soon as I tell you this, make a video. Yeah. <laughs> and in that video, give good content for three minutes or less. And then watch how many views you have. And at the time, this, this is something before they were really suppressing real estate on social media. You could put out a video and within 24 hours, get a couple thousand views. And I would always ask them, so how long would it take you to knock on a thousand doors? But even worse than that, that's a thousand views. That's people who actually watch. So you're not knocking on a thousand doors. Let's say you're knocking on 2,500 doors yep. to get a thousand people to stand in front of you. What's the time frame? If I can do this in three minutes, make a digital asset and use that repeatedly to help people, we're all in sales. The more people right. we talk to, the more we should close if we know what we're doing. So why not talk to a thousand people in three minutes instead of spend two years knocking on 2,500 doors? So that's kind of how I got into it and started with it and working with it. And then what I learned very quickly was I was blessed to have the money to be able to pay for this education. Uh, I was a member of Ryan Stuman's tribe uh, for years, and that's something that's not attainable by, by quite a few people. Uh, I was able to travel the country and listen and sit in front of Barry Habib and sit in front of Mike Ferry and Tom Ferry and, and, and listen, uh, uh, Dave Linegar, and listen to what they had to say and then adapt that into today's social media and then... I, 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 you know, even I had uh, uh, people that I would pay to come and speak in front of my my guys and teach them what they knew, and then I would take the information that they shared and dive into it even deeper, and then all of a sudden I started realizing that there's so many people, um, and, and I'm I'm big in the real estate uh, space. I'm a purchase money guy. I've been a purchase money guy since the day I got in this business, um, and I I realize that the greater majority of real estate agents 
are struggling. That's yep. that's just the reality of it. No matter what anybody else tells you, no matter what stock prices are and who's the new CEO or whatever, most real estate agents are struggling. So if I could help two people with a simple plan, if I could go out, fill a room full of real estate agents, if I could fill a room full of small business people who were struggling that didn't even know that social media was made for this, and I could put them in a room with my branch managers and my loan officers, so people who could help people, putting them together and teach them in a very short amount of time how to truly double, triple, quadruple their business in a very short amount of time, then it, it, it would be something that was bringing a true education, something that was of value to agents, small businesses, loan officers, branch managers across the country. And it was something that I was capable and able to do. And one of the greatest things that I get out of it is the follow-ups that I get from the audience telling me. I, I've got a, a, a deal coming on uh, day after tomorrow at Margaritaville here in uh, Lake Conroe, Texas. And um, very kind of strange because it's going to be like the first real during COVID that we've done where it's a live mm -hmm. thing and we're limited on, on how many people we can have. So we're, we're limited to, I think, 55 or 60 in this room. And it's a huge room. It's probably, I don't know, 5,000 square feet or larger, right. but we're limited. Um but I have 54 people who signed up immediately. I've got agents coming from Delaware to sit through this class again. They're flying to Houston, Texas to be part of this. I've got people from Colorado coming to this. So I, I get to hear what one of the guys that's coming from Delaware, he took my class when I did it right outside of Philly about two years ago. And let's say the class was over at four o'clock in the afternoon. By 6 a.m. the next morning, he had sent me a, uh, an instant message on Facebook saying, I used the things that you taught me yesterday in class. I have two listings that I don't have to fight for because of what you showed me. Wow. I appreciate this so much. 15 minutes after he sent that message, he sent me another one and said, just got another listing from what you showed me. Awesome. So in less than 12 hours, he got three listings off of this. So this is why... You know, this is why it's worth it for him to make the trek from Delaware down to Houston right. <laughs> to listen to this. Um, and, and and I don't charge people for this. It's just something that brings value to the masses. The people who want to pay attention, the people who listen, will walk away with something, and they will start. You know, for a lack of better term, cashing checks immediately. Let's go back to a couple things. Uh, you brought up Stuman, and one thing I want to mention about him is, for some reason, there's one thing he said to me that resonated and still resonates with me today is... Shave that beard? <laughs> That's coming. It's almost springtime. <laughs> the the, uh, the uh, number one thing he said was, when you're fighting a struggle, it's kind of like playing a video game. It, the struggle is the boss. If you beat the boss, you level up. And that's always resonated with me. If you're struggling and you're fighting and you're having a bad streak, it's 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 testing you. If you win, you're leveling up. And that's something I don't know why out of all the stuff I've ever heard the guy say. That's one thing that's always you know stuck in my mind, um, you know, as something, you know. Well, that that just means you're getting closer to growth. Right. I mean, it's like our it's like children. Right. The kids go through growing pains or they're, they're growing through something. So when you're going through that struggle, it's growth. So yeah. that's he, he, part likened of it. It, he likened it to Contra. So that was a game when I was young. So <laughs> maybe that's why it resonated so well. Um, the other thing I want to bring up is you talked about small businesses, not just real estate agents, but small businesses in general. And it's amazing to me. I don't know what the statistics are. I really like to find out what, you know, small businesses in this country don't understand what Facebook actually is. I mean, to most people, Facebook is just like you said, still, it's just get on there and talk with your friends from around the country. It's, you know, make a post about your business and hope your friends will support you. But people don't understand what you teach. And that is, 
you know, how to make a video, how to get it out in front of thousands of people in your community, how to create an ad, how to create a discount, you know, to bring people into your brick and mortar. I mean, that kind of stuff is it definitely needs to be taught. And I think, you know, you're doing that, not just on the real estate side. I mean, you're doing that for small businesses. Can I give you a quick stat? Yeah. So pre-COVID, pre-COVID, before any of this happened, the statistic was 240 million Americans spent four and a half hours a day on Facebook. 240 oh, wow. out of the 330 million Americans in this country spent four and a half hours a day on Facebook. Hold on. Post-COVID, <laughs> those same 240 million Americans are spending 11 hours a day on social media of some form, and they are spending seven and a half hours a day on Facebook. Wow. So if, again, we're all in sales, and, and, and I am one of those firm believers uh, I, I, I heard this so many years ago. There's two kinds of people. People who are in sales and people who don't know they're in sales. <laughs> yeah. um, I am a firm believer that we're all in sales. So if we're in sales and our job is to talk to people and I can find a platform where there's 240 million people hanging out, why would I knock on doors? Exactly. Not saying to take that away because it's necessary, especially in today's age where we have such an inventory crisis. Knocking on doors is a great thing, but why not invest 30 minutes a day into a system? And I say a system. If you do this right, and, and like you said, where I teach people how to do video, you know, there's so many things you can do. Do your Facebook Live. Do it inside of a group. Do it inside of a community, whatever that may be. Then use a system like I like Y2Mate. Use a system. Scrape that video. Now you've got a digital asset that's now an MP3. And then take that same video. Don't make it again. Take that same video. Put it in LinkedIn. Put it in whatever system that you're using or as many of them as you can. Make an IGTV video off of that same exact video using it as a digital asset. So that's that's my stat and that's just a little bit on it. So that's I'm actually wild. curious, if you're holding these classes, then let's go pre-COVID, okay? So you were in rooms with people, you were you know, training them. What percentage of the people do you feel actually execute? I'm just curious. Um, I, I'm a bit pessimistic uh -huh. on this. And I think that, that we're probably closer uh, and if we break it down, I think we're probably closer into that 80, 20 rule. Right. Of the people are doing 80% of the work. Now, my thing is, is there is a, um, uh, an unspoken loyalty. There is a, um, uh, a point inside of our systems to where we feel, um, I, I'll give you an example. So Mitch and I have been friends, acquaintances for years. No matter what, if Mitch calls me and asks me to do something for him, if it's in my realm to be able to do it, I'm going to do it for him. And and maybe it's, I, I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe it's because Mitch has been kind enough to put me on his shows. Maybe it's because Mitch actually did his mortgage with my guys. You, you know, I'm not sure what it is, but there is a reciprocity going on. So I want to say 20% walk away and do something. Mm -hmm. with it. I want to tell you that in my opinion, 95% of the people in the world are lazy and, and some they're either lazy or scared. Right. Uh, when I, yeah, talk you just answered the second question. Cause I was going to say, why do you think they don't? Because it's really easy to tell somebody to go live. It's really easy to show them how to go live. Uh, I always do a surprise thing in my classes uh, and I no matter that, how many times I do it, it's always a surprise. I find whoever's in the class, and I, I, I read people I'm watching, who is scared to death, who I think is probably going to pee themselves right. the minute that the camera gets turned on them, and I go sit beside them on live and I interview them. Right. And then once they realize that the camera didn't hurt them, 
that there was nothing there, that that was what their voice sounds like anyway, that that's what they look like anyway. The camera didn't add 10 pounds. I was this heavy yesterday. <laughs> I didn't have hair before we got on camera. <laughs> right. And human beings don't say, nobody's going to, somebody may watch this podcast and turn it off because they don't like me, but nobody is going to turn on this podcast and say, holy shit, I didn't know he was bald. Get that <laughs> shit off the television. I, you know, so right. I want to say that about 20% actually do something with okay. it. Okay. About 5% usually stick with it. And out of those 5%, I've got success stories that I talk about. And I actually, instead of just telling you about Bob over here in Peoria, Illinois, blah, 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 I actually give you their name. I make you follow them. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, just steal what they're doing. Right. right. You don't have to come up with anything on your own. Just steal what they're doing. Yeah, well, you're in another market, right? You're you're out in Arizona. But steal even, what he's doing in Illinois. Even if you're in the same market, if you and I were sitting next to each mm -hmm. other in Houston, Texas, the way that the algorithms work for social okay. media is my audience is not your audience. Got it. Even, even though, let's just say 50 people. We have 50 yep. people each in our audience, and we may have a bleed over of five, but I've got 45 people that will never see you, and you got 45 people that will never see me. There is nothing There is nothing wrong with it, and it's just do something. Well, and it's Laura and I talk about this all the time, and it's personal preference also. You know, there yeah. could be two people that are in the same right. market, you know, these people are going to love this person. These person are going to love that person and right. don't care about this person yes. because of who they are, yeah. how they, you know, how they perceive them, you know, so it doesn't matter if you're in the same market, like you said, you know, Laura and I talk about it all the time with coaches, you know, some people will probably love this coach because of what he does, but other yep. people are like, that's too much of this for me. Yeah. I like somebody that does this. I, I talk about Mike Ferry and Tom Ferry, and I don't know if you guys are, are old enough to know the difference right. between the two. So one is the father, one is the son. Um, one in his coaching, uh, is kind of like, I guess my, the, the fathers of my age group when I was a kid were, you know, my arms broken, rub some dirt on it and run the second day. <laughs> That's right. All right. The other one is very much kumbaya. Let's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and for me, I would much rather, I, I respond better and I listen better to somebody who is direct and says, go there and do this. And hell, I'm good with doing that. Um, so you're, you're hundred percent correct. And uh, I, one of the things that I'm so glad you brought that up, Mitch, because I think that some people have issues with that. So uh, like I said at the beginning, I'm a Grant Cardone fan. Um, he, he, puts his pants on the same way that I do, jumps off the bed, does it in the air before he hits the ground, you know, <laughs> whatever that may be. So he's not any better than I am, but damn, he makes sense. And he's got a lot, a lot of history in doing something. So he's somebody that I can relate to besides the fact that we're, you know, close to the same age, things like that. Now there are some very young guys uh, I, I see that there's coaches out there that are, you know, 24, 25 years old. And it's nothing against that 24 or 25 year old guy, but we don't have the same uh, experience. We don't have the same insight. We haven't been through the same thing. It's like, you know, for me, uh, I, I'm an older guy, I'm a big guy. Uh, my weightlifting uh, coach is my age. The last thing in the world I want to do is go to some 25-year-old kid that has no idea what it's like to be a 53-year-old man and says, you know, put 325 on the bar and lift it 25 times. Okay, but what about my, you know, my tendonitis or what about, you know, don't worry about it, you know. <laughs> so um, I think it's important that you find what works for you. Not necessarily what works for everybody else. I, right. I see people that are saying, "Man, I love the way so and so, uh, you know, you know, is doing so so good listening to this person." But I just that person is not for me, and I'm trying to let. Don't find somebody else. Find somebody who is in your scope. Somebody that resonates with you. That's that's what it's all about. Amen. Yeah. So is the 
first key just doing something? Like, is that the very first step is just do something? Go out there, try it, do something. Is that your recommendation? So somewhere in my first, after my intro slides in, in when I go out and teach these classes, and I do more than that. I, I, I recruit, I bring people in. I've got my own team inside of NRL Mortgage. Um, but in the very first slides that I talk about, there's two things. And what you just said, Laura, resonates. It's 100%. The first one is, is I, I t make them do an agreement to do something. I am begging you. Then the next thing, the next slide. Now, here's something I found because uh, pre-COVID, I talked to somewhere between 10 and 20,000 real estate agents a year. Uh, post COVID, I'm lucky if last year I was probably the keynote at, I don't know, let's say 20 events last year, which is really low for me. Uh, so I'm lucky if I actually got to talk to 5,000 plus agents last year. Um, but one of the things that I, 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 when I talked to them, I interviewed them, I asked them, so why aren't you going live? Why aren't you posting? And she's, I don't know, you know, it, it, it's, you do it, you you do so well at it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't, my first videos were horrible. But what I learned was, is I think people need to be given permission. I agree. Now, here's how I do this now. I have a slide that shows all of these, you know, awards that I've gotten, most connected mortgage professional, uh, top 100 executive in the in the country, you know, uh, uh, military uh, um, uh, employer, things like that. So I show all of these, not to brag, but to give credibility. If for some reason, National Mortgage Professional says that these 10 LOs that, that work with me are in the top 100, if National Mortgage Professional says that I am one of the most connected in the industry, if I get social media awards from Facebook, then somehow there's got to be some sort of credibility with that. Now, my very next slide is, if I've got this credibility, I am giving you permission to go live. I oh, am giving good. you permission right. to use Facebook. I am giving you permission because if all of these people say that I'm credible, then, then you should at least believe it or part of you believe it. And then the other half of you need to use this because if I don't have the credibility to give you permission to go live, nobody else does. So tell me this. Okay. So me, for example, I hated going on camera <laughs> in the beginning. So I do these events now with Laura and others, you know, I do the podcast now with Laura, that kind of stuff comes easy to me now. Yep. But mm -hmm. still yep. pushing my button and going live where I could screw up and look like an idiot, that that is scary to me still. So I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that feel the way, same way. So what do you tell them? How do they get over that initial, you know, pushing the live button? Because I think that's probably everybody's biggest fear is is getting hitting live and you don't get a retake. It's, you know, whatever you say is that's what you get. <laughs> Until about four or five years ago, I didn't have a really good answer. My answer would have been about four or five years ago. My answer would have been just do it. They can't hurt you. They can't eat you. Uh, the only thing they can do is laugh. There's not ever been anybody say, oh, my God, did you see Mitch's video? He is never allowed to come to the house again, <laughs> ever come to the house. He did so poorly. He is never allowed to come to the house. But I will tell you this. There's another guy, and if you guys – you may want to reach out and get him. I don't know if he is what you guys are looking for, but there is a, uh, a listing agent in the Dallas Fort Worth area. His name is Hoss Pratt, H O S S P R A T T, I believe. And uh, I listened to him one time and he is, he's one of those guys. He's, you know, Dave Linegar, the Mike and Tom Ferry, the Buffini. He's that level kind of guy. And uh, I listened to him one time and he told a story about his daughter asking him, you know, how do you do this? How do you go to up to a stranger and ask them to represent them uh, to where you list their half million million dollar home? And he started thinking about it and what he said he does. And, I, and I'm sure I'm screwing this up somewhere. And I, I mean, no 
ill intentions, but this is how I, I listened and I learned it from, from what I, I recollect is he says that he has a persona sort of like, and, and he brought this up sort of like in that movie. I don't remember the name of it where Sylvester Stallone went and he arm wrestled everybody. Right. And before he did, he turned his hat around and he went from being a truck driver to being, you know, the champion arm wrestler. Right. Haas said that when he goes out on a listing appointment, he's not Haas Pratt anymore. He's Haas the listing boss. So now he has changed and he has his persona as Haas the listing boss. And Haas the listing boss doesn't fail. Haas the listing boss doesn't even need that S on his shirt because he's already that guy. And and I, I really liked his analogy. Now, it doesn't work for everybody, but I think if you can get over that part of fear, because they can't eat you no matter what. I mean, think about it. And, and I tell people in these classes, the very first video you do is going to be the worst video you've oh, ever yeah. done. The second video is going to be the second worst video you've ever done. The 40th video is going to be the 40th worst video you've ever done. So think of it the same way, Mitch. You've got an amazing, amazing message. You've got a great voice. You've got a great presence. If I see you on stage and you're stuttering, that's because of you, man. It's not because it's in your mind. It's not because of the message. Right. You are really good at what you do. It doesn't matter what anybody else in the world, because think about it this way, man. No matter what, let's say there's 10 people in a room. No matter what, you're always going to have at least one hater, no matter what. Somebody who's too scared to do what you're doing is going to hate on you. And let's say it's a huge one. Let's say it's three out of 10 people are haters. Those other seven people are listening to what you're saying, and you are a mentor to them. You are teaching them something, whether it be the full 30 minutes, hour, two hours that you're talking, or it's one little piece that they take away, sort of like I did with Hoss the Listing Boss. Hoss will always be tops in my books because that one piece that I took away, he may not even know that he's a mentor. Yeah, of similar mine. to the one for student. He, he doesn't know. He yep. Hoss doesn't. Hoss probably doesn't know my name, but I watch him, and he's somebody that I can rely on. And those seven out of ten people need you. They're your audience. They need you to be there. They need you to be you, and they need you to bring that message. Yeah, and I love that, Johnny. And you said a couple of really valuable things. One, you spoke about mindset, right? I mean, if you listen to Tony Robbins or you listen to any of those really big speakers, right? They have a routine that they go into to put their mind in the right place, right? I mean, even Steve Sims mentioned it when we interviewed him. And he said, man, you know, before I go out there, I kind of get in the zone and I get myself ready to go. So just like what you just mentioned with Haas. So that's one. And then the second thing, and, and I know I had to get comfortable with this when I started. And just so you know, Johnny, Mitch was the first person that forced me to do a live. So I actually owe him for that. And he knows that, right? So I'm forever that grateful. That is right. Yeah, so he gets the kudos on that one. But the second thing, and you are correct, I always think to myself, I'm not speaking to the masses. I'm speaking to that one person that needs to hear my message. Love now, it could be right. more than one. Could be more than one. I'm right. not saying it's only one. But as long as I know that I'm resonating and connecting and making a difference of someone listening to me, to that one person, then there's value. So just speak to that person. That's awesome. You know, one of the things that I do when I when I talk to and I, I you know, I don't want to get into some just ridiculous thing, but I, I think that probably men have an easier time making fools of themselves than women do. <laughs> You're probably uh, correct. <laughs> but my thing is, think about this. And this is one of the reasons I, I one of my favorite things is is I call it, you know, Mitch's strong women group that he does. But <laughs> um, think about it. How many how many women need to hear your voice, yeah. your message to empower them or to let them know that they have permission to do something? Men, we're pretty stupid. We'll say stupid shit all the time and it doesn't <laughs> matter. 
We don't, have to, uh, we don't have to worry about if our hair's right or if our makeup looks good today. That's or... right. <laughs> yeah. You know how many people I was worried about not liking my hair today? Zero. Zero? Was that zero? zero. <laughs> but I think women need this. And and I love I love the fact that that there are so many, there's so many out there already. Yes. But there's so many that are coming out because and Laura, I, I'm begging you. And you've been doing this, so I mean, it's not like it's something new. But but I'm even asking you to expand. I'm asking you to please help other ones. I, I want to say the majority of real estate agents are probably female. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I, I am telling you that they need to hear your voice. They need to hear you give them permission and tell them it's okay to have an opinion, to, to help people, to teach people. And to be the the warrior that they are. Yeah. yeah and, and I'll tell you amen, what. Amen to that, Johnny. And you're it, correct. The time is now. And yeah. it's funny that you bring that up, Johnny, because Laura and I are teaming up on our next event, March 16th. I and it actually that. is leading women of mortgage and real estate. And so, real estate. So we're, we're bringing that message. And, and we got some, some yeah. top of the line real estate uh, ladies that are coming on, you know, because she's been in the business for 43 years. She's been a number one yes. at, in the world and in the U.S. for a long time with Century 21. And, you know, overall, so we got some powerful women coming to this event. Do you have room to add one more? I think we're full right now. Okay. But Next we're definitely one. going to be doing another one of these. I, I have a lady that I am just so amazed with. Uh, she has, at this moment in time, probably... 7,7500 real estate agents underneath her. Oh, wow. um, she is so far into the seven figure uh, earnings that that's that, awesome. It, and and it's somebody that 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 your audience needs. Yeah, definitely connect me with her because like I said, this isn't going to be the last one of these we do because I think it's a great mix between, you know, real estate and mortgage and you know, to, to bring them both together is going to be, uh, you know, pretty fun. Right. All right, Johnny, this has been amazing. We absolutely learned. We grew. This was inspiring. So thank you so much for being a guest. And now, how can people learn more about you? How can they connect? How can they follow? How can they learn all about? Well, that's another big piece about me. I'm all about uh, transparency and I don't hide from anybody. So there's a number of ways. Uh, I'm always on Facebook. So you can look me up and it's Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, Fowler, F-O-W-L-E-R. My nickname and what I go by is Johnny. And you can find me that way also. My uh, phone number, cell phone, 281-352-7307. My website, johnnyfowler.com, J-O-N-N-Y-F-O-W-L-E-R.com. Uh, but Facebook is usually the easiest way to find me. Everything I have is open. Everything is public. There is nothing. You can put comments on my board, whatever it is you want to do, uh, completely transparent. And a, a little plug, Johnny will be our uh, special guest coach in my Elite Mastermind program. Um, so if anybody's interested in learning more about you know, what Johnny is doing at these events to show people about social media, you know, get a hold of us and, and we'll direct you into how to get involved with that. Awesome. I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, I, I, I always look forward to this. This is something that um, uh, means the world to me. It tugs at my heartstrings and I appreciate you guys. And I am so grateful that you're doing this and getting information out to where real people can see real people that they can know and touch. And it's not paying a thousand dollars to go see somebody on stage. Agreed. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This has been extremely valuable. All the best to you always. Thank, Thank you, guys. you, Johnny.